let's get started. Hello, my name is Calvin. For those of you who don't know me, I work here. Um, today, I've been turned into an ophthalmology resident for some reason, um, and I'm presenting a case of vision loss. And then as you can see, I work here because my name's on the bottom. It says PGY1, also known as soon to be middle child PGY. Um, but we're almost there. So objectives. Um, the point of this, hopefully, or at least three things we'll take away from this, we'll learn the evaluation and findings that are associated with uh, this mystery eye ailment, which we will discuss further uh, coming up. Uh, we'll review the differential for vision loss, um, in this case, sudden vision loss, both painful and painless causes. And then we'll examine the treatment goals, therapeutic options related to, again, insert mystery as of yet to be revealed case uh, cause of vision loss. So we'll start off with um, the chief complaint. Uh, much like our friend Jaden, our patient comes in and says that he can't see. Um, the details of the case, we have a 54-year-old man who presents with a past medical history of hypertension diabetes, says that he lost vision suddenly in his left eye, um, only his left eye. He reports no history of trauma, but does say that his um, eye history is significant for being farsighted and wearing contact lenses. Uh, you move on to a quick physical exam. Uh, everything is normal uh, for the most part, except for the fact that he can't see out of his left eye. Um, he does have equal round reactive um, pupils on both sides. Um, he's got no photophobia. He's got full motion of his extraocular muscles. And he has no deficits on neuro exam other than the fact that he can't see out of his left eye. So you move on to your opto exam. Uh, expectation versus reality, as per usual. And you pull out your Snellen chart, you get a quick visual acuity because we all do that. Um, and you find that the right eye is 2020, and then the left eye is 20 over 200, which may just be because every Snellen chart starts with an E on the top, who knows. Um, you move on to your fundoscopic exam. So uh, given the findings of your visual acuity exam, you dilate, you pull out some tools, you grab your suitcase, some mirrors, some crystals, some headgear, which we all have make some quick calculations, uh, and you somehow come up with this image, which should be quite classic. Hopefully uh, you recognize this from some question you've had in the past when you were a med student and or resident. So before we reveal specifically what this is, let's go over a quick differential. Our friend Jaden again here to help us. Um, we'll start kind of uh, out of order. We'll move to the painful side first on the right. So optic neuritis can be associated with sudden vision loss. Um, it's also, in, as you can see in parentheses, uh, usually associated with MS. Um, giant cell arteritis can also cause sudden vision loss, although that's usually painful. Uh, again, that would be in an older population, this is an inflammatory condition. And then acute angle closure glaucoma also can cause um, vision loss, but in this case, again, it would be painful. Uh, moving to the painless side on the left, uh, listed first for no obvious reason, is central retinal artery occlusion. Um, there's also central retinal vein occlusion, which is the same thing, but on the venous side. Um, retinal detachment can also be uh, lead to painless vision loss, but you would usually get the classic uh, finding of a curtain coming down over the eye or something similar to that. Uh, vitreous hemorrhage can also cause painless vision loss, although that usually is a little bit more subacute in course. Um, and then any like occipital stroke or even like a sight condition like conversion syndrome could technically cause painless vision loss as well. Although you would usually see other symptoms, oh, well, I guess conversion, you'll always see one symptom. Um, so, oh, I gave it away. Okay, um, so central retinal artery occlusion is actually what that was. Um, uh, this, again, is something that presents with sudden painless uh, monocular vision loss. Um, it actually is interesting that the degree of vision loss can vary. So um, it can be anywhere from complete loss of vision, so you can only make out light, to not so bad where you actually are able to make out fingers. Um, and depending on the amount of vision loss you have, you may or may not still have a pupillary, uh, afferent pupillary defect to light. Um, again, it kind of is in the name, but um, it's caused by an occlusion of the retinal artery, which is the first branch off the carotid. Um, and the blockage is most commonly embolic in origin. Um, the patient will usually have, as you can see here, um, the classic finding of a cherry red macula. Uh, fun note, the reason the macula is red is because one, it gets supply from a different place, the um, choroid artery, cord something, so, never mind, I'll leave that out. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, the only other thing that was important was that uh, there was one study that showed that the cherry red spot on, of the macula is actually an early finding that's identified in up to 90% of patients with central retinal artery occlusion. So it's actually a pretty um, good thing to look for. The last point is that this is an ophthalmologic emergency. It is associated with irreversible vision loss if not corrected in a timely manner. So again, just a little bit more about the disease. The most common cause is um, embolic. Um, the embolus usually comes either from the carotid or from the heart. Um, there were uh, some cases that showed that uh, most or some patients with this disease actually have some kind of shunt in the heart that allows um, right-sided um, clots to pass over to the other side and then cause a uh, loss of vision on the left. Um, thrombosis is also something that can happen. Um, there were some plaques identified on MRI in some cases of CRAO. Um, in the case of thrombosis, you usually have uh, pre preceding events, uh, something called amaurosis fugax, which I'm sure we've all run into before as med students, um, which again is just transient vision loss that corrects on its own before this big event where you lose your vision for an extended period of time. Um, inflammatory conditions can also cause this. Um, hypercoagulable conditions can also cause this. And some other things, glaucoma, uh, pressure in the inner part of the eye can actually uh, cause so much pressure that it overcomes the arterial pressure and then causes vision loss through a pseudo occlusion. So as far as the workup, uh, fundoscopy is your best friend in this. Um, it is important to try to find that cherry red macula if you can. It is, again, a very um, clinically significant finding if you are able to find it. Um, other things that you might be able to see on fundoscopy that could point to another cause of painless vision loss, a detached retina you might see, um, which would point you in another direction. The blood and thunder uh, image, which I probably should have included on here but didn't, is um, the classic finding for central retinal vein occlusion. Um, vitreous hemorrhage can also be seen. You'd actually just see like leaking from the vessels in the back of the eye. Um, as far as blood work, um, you can send off, you know, CVCs, ANA, PTTs, and what you're basically looking for is any kind of uh, platelet disorder, coagulopathy, any inflammatory markers um, that could point you towards a different cause, um, possibly of vasculitis or something, uh, some kind of bleeding disorder that is causing, or clotting disorder really, that is causing this. And then the other thing that was mentioned was an EKG. Um, arrhythmias obviously predispose you to uh, development of things like atrial thrombi, and so you can get an EKG and maybe you catch an arrhythmia, um, which suggests a possible source to you. Continuing with our workup, I know we have ultrasound people uh, in our lives. This is actually just a uh, commercial fishing ultrasound ad that I took a picture from. But in any case, ultrasound can be useful, uh, both in diagnosis and evaluation of, um, or of vision loss, um, it can identify a thrombus, so you can have cardiac echo, you can find an atrial thrombus, as previously mentioned, um, which could point you towards a possible cause for this. You can get an ultrasound on their neck, find a thrombus in the carotid, which could also be causing this. Um, and then you can move on to an eye ultrasound, and you can identify all sorts of intraocular etiologies um, that could cause painless vision loss, including a vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachment. And there was actually one study, a case report that was published in 2019, where the authors actually found a clot in the eye. Um, how specific this is, I have no idea, but you know, for the ultrasound savvy people out there, it's something you could possibly look for. So the most important part of the workup is that you should call op though. This is one of the few things where there's not much we can do in the emergency department, and we'll get into a discussion of the treatments in a second. Um, but the other thing that was that has come up a couple of times in the literature and is mentioned in Tintinelli's is getting a neuroconsult because um, a lot of times the CRAO, because it's embolic in origin, is associated with uh, some other type of embolic stroke. Um, there was one case report of 58 patients uh, where they found 32% of them had acute or subacute um, infarcts in their brain on MRI. Um, but otherwise had no other symptoms other than loss of vision. Mm -hmm. So it is something that can be missed and is actually worth considering just bringing the patient in for further workup. So the last part of the treatment, again, is, uh, is going over the goal. The goal with this is restoration of blood flow within 90 minutes. Um, all the literature points to 90 minutes being the point with um, the greatest uh, chance for full recovery of vision. 
Um, right now, most of the guidelines point to a restoration, uh, a restoration within four hours, uh, which is associated with at least a chance for partial recovery. As far as possible treatments, um, we'll go over them real quick and then we'll talk about which one of them is or isn't the best. So dislodging the clot with ocular massage is probably the most common one. It's the one we see a lot in our uh, emergency medicine literature, most likely because it's the easiest to pull off in the emergency department. You kind of just push pressure on the eye for 15 seconds and then let go. And at some point, the change in the pressure is supposed to dislodge the clot. Um, I don't know if it works or not, but that's from Ace Ventura, if anyone has seen that movie. Um, you can also try to reduce the intraocular pressure. Again, if you create enough of a pressure gradient, I think the idea is that you can dislodge the clot and restore flow. You can get really crazy, put some TPA in the patient and see if you can destroy the clot. Um, other things, I was gonna put a picture of eye surgery that ophthalmologists do, but then I saw like scalpels and blades inside of eyeballs and I got really uncomfortable. So I just switched to this, which is, you know, lasers. Um, if you, the reason why you consult opto is because they have access to a lot more um, tools. So they can do a laser embolectomy, a vitrectomy. Um, you can also just try to do salvage things like increasing their FiO2, um, which can hope or theoretically will provide at least some oxygen to the areas of the eye that are still being perfused. And the last thing is you can try to just reduce, reduce the amount of edema in the retina by giving um, steroids. The bottom line, as uh, promised, is that there is no conclusive evidence that supports any of these treatments over the other. Um, so the glass half full way of looking at that is that you can try anything to really try to fix the problem, um, get everyone on board as soon as you can, and then really just try to um, throw the kitchen sink at it and hopefully something works. But unfortunately, there's no studies that have shown superiority of any of these treatments. So. While you're in the emergency department, I guess just squish on their eye and hope that it comes loose. In summary, um, history and PE are the most important in guiding the um, differential for these patients with painless vision loss. Painful, for pain, painful versus painless is one of the big um, branch points in this differential. And what you find on fundoscopy and on ultrasound um, can really actually just provide you with the diagnosis. Uh, if you're as good as the ultrasound and the ultrasonographers in that study, you just find the clot, kind of gives you your answer. Um, the central retinal artery occlusion findings, again, on history will be rapid painless vision loss, most often, or almost 99% of the time, monocular. Um, on physical exam, you should hopefully find that cherry red macula um, that provides you with the answer you're looking for. And again, the goal of uh, treatment is restoration of flow within 90 minutes for full recovery of vision, um, and in general, treatment is based on the cause, but embolic cause or embolism is the most common cause. All right, so just under the gun. Oh, no. Eh, eh. Oh, no, it won't advance. What have I done? All right, that works. Okay, so preguntas. No preguntas. Calvin, did, um, did he have atrial fibrillation? The His patient? patient? No, there. This is a made-up patient, but oh, okay. Because I've seen no. this uh, just a few times, and everyone I've seen has actually had underlying atrial fib. Uh, and you mentioned getting an EKG to um, to look, you know, for cardiac causes, and that's the one I've seen in every case that I've seen, which is about two or three cases. They they had atrial underlying atrial fib. The other thing just that I've seen that wasn't mentioned in your diff is that sometimes, especially elderly patients will come in saying they just lost their vision a couple days ago or even today. And you go to look at their eyes and they have these, this big cataract that they probably had a long time. And then this was the final straw that broke the camel's back and now they come in. So, and that I've seen a few times where I expected to see the this or retinal uh, venous thrombosis and they had actually a big cataract and just realized now that their vision got bad uh yes so two great points by dr grinsheimer um again because embolism is the most likely cause something like afib would be uh you would assume something that would be good to find um, and yes, I was going to include cataracts, but most of the time I've been, what I've read is that that is a slow loss of vision. Um, but I agree, I have had patients who've come into the ED and said they suddenly lost vision. And it's just a giant cataract on their eye. So thank you for pointing that out. 
Any other questions? Yes. Calvin implied it in terms of the presentation, which is it's a good thing to remember when you're just uh, communicating with your ophthalmology colleague that visual acuity obviously we use Snellen, but that if, if they can't see the Snellen chart, and Calvin said this, you're going to go down to fingers, and then you're going to go to light and no light. Um, so you can't just say, oh, they can't see. And then I, I would just uh, echo the neurology comment. I think that for this central venous arterial, it would be an issue to have neurology involved and treat this uh, kind of like a stroke uh, to mitigate the stroke of the In case anyone at home needed to hear that, Dr. Willis really agrees with me. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I think the two points were that. Um, one, neuro consults, very important for patients like these. And then the other point was um, the visual card. acuity. Yes, is Snellen important. Card, fingers, which you said. Yes, important for opto to at least know how much vision the patient has. So if they can't give you a number based on a Snellen chart, at the very least, either finger counting, movement, light uh, is helpful for them. Any other preguntas? They, they might not stick it out as a short thing. Uh, Derek has astutely pointed out that if the triage team misses this, you can call it as a stroke code when you find it. Anyone else? No one? All right, so thank you to the Clinical Pearls team and to everyone who's been working during this uh, wonderful COVID time that we're in. Um, and then a quick shout out to everyone out here who's having acne problems like me. All righty, so references. Thank you.